Mila Mahogat and Shumra Nochta. Joining me in studio this evening is Martin Hayden of Fine Gael, Stephen Dunley of the Social Democrats, Professor John Crown, Consultant Oncologist at St. Vincent's Hospital, and Mick Barry, AAA, PBP TD, and Nia Lines, Political Editor of The Times Ireland. You can contact the programme by text on 51551, email late debate at rte.ie, and you can follow and engage on Twitter at late debate rte. Well, as you've heard, in Eileen's uh, news bulletin there, arguably, I would say for a second time tonight, in the last half an hour, the government was defeated in the Dáil. And it was on an issue that affects so many people throughout the country. The Labour Party called for increases in the national minimum wage and more protection for low-paid workers. The government amended this and the government was defeated. Fianna Fáil and Sinn Féin, as well as the AAA, PBP and Independence for Change, worked t- together to defeat the amendment. Now, Martin Hayden of <coughs> Fine Gael, Labour put forward concrete steps, you, you could argue, to help the low-paid workers in the country. You effectively said no. Well, Cormac, within the programme for government, there's very concrete steps about helping low-paid workers. And, you know, at the broader issue, when you look at it and you think of where we've come from over the last five years where unemployment was at 15.1%, government's approach here is very much about getting the balance right. Absolutely, we want to see people um, in, in, in jobs that pay as well as possible. But that balance has to be got right with the ability of small and medium-sized employers to make sure that they can continue to create those jobs and generate the income uh, for that to come The in. concrete steps that were put forward by Labour in the Dáil tonight, they affect so many people possibly listening to this programme. For example, ending zero-hour contracts. You said we will not do this at this time. Why? Because there was a, a report commissioned uh, through the University of Limerick uh, that reported back in November that said, you know, the prevalence of zero-hour contracts will, uh, was not particularly extensive. And the Low Pay Commission, which we established last year, has looked at issues uh, regarding uh, increases in minimum wage. And I remind you that Fine Gael was the lead party in government um, the last time that reinstated the cut of Fine Gael, previous to that of the minimum wage, and in more recently, in, since the 1st of January, increased it again. Um, so you say, are you saying that because they're not prevalent, the zero-hour contracts, that you shouldn't do anything about them now? <laughs> There's an ongoing review, and uh, as, as far as the Minister uh, Mitchell O'Connor in an answer to a PQ yesterday <coughs> said it's something that um, is, is, her department are taking on board um, the University of Limerick um, report and uh, in all... You had a chance tonight to do it, to end zero-hour contracts or, or commit to do so. You said no. The second thing in the Labour, the, the second concrete step it would seem uh, to an observer from Labour's motion tonight was an increase in the minimum wage. Which we have committed to in the programme for government. Uh, and we've committed to sticking with uh, the Low Pay Commission, which are due uh, to give their annual report now on the 19th of July, I think it is. Um, and, you know, the increase that came in January was from a recommendation from them from last July. And if there's an increase proposed again this time, we will stick with that. And we've, uh, we want to see the minimum wage increase um, over the lifetime of this government up to €10.50. But everything we say is about the balance. And I bring you back to the point that... Mick Barry is shaking his head. Why, Mick? Uh, Well, what Martin is just after um, outlining there is a plan to increase the minimum wage to to €10.50 within the lifetime of this government, in other words, uh, €10.50 presumably, of the space of five years. Uh, I mean, that is just incredible. And you're talking about uh, getting the balance right. Well, the balance has resulted in a situation where you've got 23% 23% of Irish full-time workers who are low paid is a greater percentage than any other country in the entire OECD with the exception of the United States and South Korea. Um, and we've got a, a huge uh, rent pressures bearing down on people including low paid workers. I mean, the city that uh, I'm representing uh, uh, in Cork um the entire increase in the minimum wage that you're talking about there, Martin, has been wiped out uh, by rent increases. Martin? Look, when you look at the recovery and who has benefited most from the recovery, the person who was unemployed in 2011, 2012, who is in employment now, is the person who has benefited the most. There is no doubt. The simple fact we're talking about increases in the minimum wage is a pointer to how the, the, the economy has recovered. And yes, we, we absolutely have to see that rise in balance. 
at the same time, we need to make sure that we, we don't lose our competitiveness. We know what happens yeah. during the boom. What does that mean, lose our competitiveness? Lose our competitiveness means we get to a point where the small business who's thinking of taking on that extra worker somewhere all around the country and not just in the major, major urban areas where, where we see the regional growth um, throughout all the regions, uh, in people increase in jobs, the small employer who is to the pin or the collar to come around every Friday pay, to, make sure, to, to make sure they come up with the, the pressure there is to come up with five or six pay, pay packets every Friday. Well, that's no joke either. Let's, let's look at this person that Martin is talking about. Uh, the worker who was unemployed in 2011 is the person who has benefited the most, according to Martin, from the recovery. Martin, the, the worker who was unemployed in 2011 is oftentimes the worker who was employed in 2010 at 16 or 17 euro an hour, who's coming back into the workforce now at 10 or 11 euro an hour. That is the reality of the policies that the but last But the reality as well, surely the point Martin is making, I'll bring in Stephen Dunley in just a second, is that... If you have a small business or a medium-sized business, you're still struggling in this country, an awful lot of them. So what should the minimum wage be? What should they have to pay by law to low-paid workers, in your opinion? In my opinion, the national minimum wage should be increased to uh, €12 an hour this year as a step towards €14 Euro an hour by the middle of 2018. But your Ismay will tell you straight out that that would put an awful lot of businesses out of business. Well, interestingly, uh, in the city of Seattle in the United States, uh, where you've had this massive campaign which has swept the United States of $15 now, Seattle has become the first city to agree to $15. <coughs> it's being f- phased in over the next five years. But it went to 11 last year and 12 and 13 this year, and there were all kinds of reports and all kinds of warnings that this would lead to a wipeout so of small and medium a, business. A 40, it hasn't happened. Oh, you're saying a 14 it euro minimum happened. wage when? By the middle of 2018. Is that doable, Stephen Donnelly, in your opinion? <clears throat> no. It had closed down businesses all over the country and it would lead to a huge surge in unemployment. Um, but the, the, the right answer, I think, is probably somewhere in between what uh, Mick and Fine Gael are proposing, you have to start with what it is you want to achieve, right? And the, what we're missing in the conversation is a bit of joined up thinking. For the Social Democrats, what we want to achieve, it's not based on the wage per se, it's based on a society that says, if you go out and you work for a week, be you working in a high paid job or a, or a low paid job, you earn enough that you can lead a dignified life and your family can lead a dignified life without having to have all of these uh, payments from the state, right? And Mick is absolutely correct. We have, I think, the second highest level of wage inequality in Europe. That is a profoundly bad thing and we need to correct that. And one way you correct that um, is you, you, you bring in a living wage, you transition into a living wage. So I absolutely agree with Which Mick. should be what? Um, well, there's a single figure used of 11.50, which ICTU have gone for it. Now, we, we've spoken to ICTU about it, and I've made the point to them that actually the Dublin wage and the Cork wage and the Roscommon wage actually are different. Because the whole concept of a living wage is you work bloody hard during the week, and at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, you can lead a dignified life. Now, the reality is it costs different amounts of money to do that in different parts uh, of the country. So you're saying a one-size-fits-all is pointless, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a blunt tool. So, so what do you need to do? You do need to move to a living wage, but a living wage is determined not just by the wage, but how much things cost, right? Okay, so, yes, you need a living can wage. I just say, can I interrupt there, yeah, sure. if you don't mind? Are the social democrats then saying that a living wage in Dublin could be, could be for argument's sake, twelve euro? I think, but a, 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 I, I, I think it's around. Uh, now, I could be wrong in this. I think. I think. A, no, it's higher than eleven sixty-five. Let's say for argument's sake, Stephen Donnelly. Let's, let's say I think it might be around thirteen, thirteen euro. Okay, let's say for argument's sake, the Social Democrats propose thirteen euro in Dublin. Yeah. But if you're living in Kerry, or Galway, or Roscommon, you're saying that at the same time their living wage should be. 11 euro? Well, our policy is to agree with the ICTU one, but partly that's because it's a simple message. And this is a much more complicated conversation, right? But ultimately, it's not about everyone in the country on a low wage being paying the same amount. It is about having a republic in which everyone who goes out to work and works can lead a dignified life. Now, we have the second highest gross wage inequality in Europe. That's a really bad thing. But actually, our net uh, wage position is about average and the reason is because there's massive social transfers and um, so what we want to see is we want to see uh, a movement to a living wage I personally would be very open to looking at a Dublin wage versus a rest of Ireland wage would because, because the costs are unequal fun- 
No, the costs are fundamentally different. They're fundamentally different. So let, like, let's recognise that. Let's just not apply the wrong number everywhere. Let's, let's apply the right number everywhere. And like they have it in the UK. Um, you have top-ups for public sector workers for living in London, for example. But, but are, the are, other, rents, I, sorry, are rents in, uh, and mortgages in Cork and in Limerick and in Galway cities now that different to Dublin? Yeah, they're much different. Rent is different. Mortgages are different. Childcare is different. Uh, there's lots of bits and pieces. But hold on, now, this, can, this is more complex. If you're in Galway 4, for example, and uh, um, Salubri is part of Galway City, is it different to uh, if you're living in a less salubrious part of Dublin? Yeah, you obviously have to pick a balance. I mean, you could bring it down to postcodes, you know, obviously, but you, you, that's not practical. No, but, so but you're there, using there a, a broad brushstroke to say Galway is cheaper, Dublin is more expensive. And the people in Galway would, would suffer. It's not the case. Well, no, they wouldn't, because the average house prices are lower, the average rents are lower, the average childcare costs are lower, like the average costs are a lot lower. But can, can I just, can I ju- just move on um, to say, you've got to look at the, the, the living wage. You have to address zero-hour contracts. They should be gone. You've got to stop the kind of stuff that happened to the Cleary's workers. That needs to be stopped. It's a loophole, in my opinion, in, 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 in Irish law. But there's two other things you have to do as well. You have to join the dots. Yes, we have to pay people the right amount of money. We also have to systematically look at the costs of living and the costs of doing business in this country. It is too expensive to live in this country, and it is too expensive to do business in this country. Who's to blame for that, though? Ultimately, I think the legislators are to blame for that yeah, I, because we could solve it. We could look at legal fees. We could look at how the energy market is regulated. Um, we could make childcare affordable in the morning. Um, we could lend the, the weight of the state to uh, making the mortgage rates affordable. Like Irish businesses now, I, I could be wrong in this, but the, the, the National Competitiveness Council report came out about four or five weeks ago and Irish SMEs are paying 60% more for their loans than the European average, right? So one way to, to help businesses have more money to pay their employees is to help them reduce the costs. It's too okay, expensive and that's, in a sim- this that's a simple point. But another very difficult one to get at, Martin Hayden of Finnegale, is what is a low-paid worker in this country? What do you regard as low-paid in this country? Is it 30,000, 20,000, 40,000? What is it? I don't know. I suppose if you're below the industrial, the average industrial wage, uh, that's that's low. It, it is. What is that? Uh, is it 27? 33. Or 30, 33 now. 33 now. So, so, it, so, oh, okay, so for argument's sake, do you regard people earning 40,000 as being above that, being just having a little bit of comfort? No, because the problem is, um, and a lot of what we do we, we, when we talk about fairness is about making sure that um, you, you try and have fairness across the board. And the problem with somebody on 40 or 45,000 a year is you're just above that uh, level where you can get any of the state supports. Oh, okay, but that's my, my question to you. That's my question to you. What do you regard as a low paid worker in the country? Well, the point I was going to make was. The, 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 to follow through is that you can't look at this it, it, when you talk about the, the average industrial wage you, you talk about the, the fairness of, of different salaries without looking at our tax system and our tax system has been proven to be one of the most progressive around as well so when you're making comparisons with other countries make you have to also accept yeah I know hold on you're making comparisons now with other countries that is not the question I ask you I'm asking you what, what do you regard as a I mean it's simple if you're going to tackle this issue at all you have to come up with some kind of level some kind but, of barometer so, so what do you regard as a low paid worker it's a simple some, somebody, question somebody who's in the region Region of the minimum wage at present, or who, where even the discussion about the minimum wage can even have an impact. See, but you said thir- thirty-three thousand. Is that right? Yeah. Look, if you're below that, then you're in the lower sphere. And um, if you're forty thousand, is that? That's my question to you. Is that low paid or not? Well, it, I, I don't consider it um, extravagant or well paid. No, I don't consider no. it well paid. So that's low paid. But it's relative. It's all. Right. I, I know it's relative. But what do you regard for the purposes of this? For, to tackle the issue, what do you regard as low paid? People are listening. People want to find out what you think, what Fine Gael thinks, what is low paid, because if you tackle it, they want to know if they're in that bracket. Is 50,000 low paid? But what we've said in terms of the, the minimum wage of 10 euro 50 is as, as our goal, true with the low paid commission uh, following on from their recommendations each year. In five so, years? Yeah. In five years time? And, and, and that's what we see as the particularly low paid. But I'm not going to sit here and say that somebody on 35,000 or 40,000 who's hit What's with, the cut off? All, all the charges... 
like what we, what we have to look back to is the back to the point of balance. That, we, but we, this, that, like you don't, you can't give me an answer. But Mick is talking about. A, a, but you're a, afraid a, to give me an no, answer. No, but I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what an answer is. A minimum wage of fourteen euro an hour to make his proposing here would decimate this country. Those hundred and fifty-five thousand people that are in work since Action Plan for Jobs came in in twenty twelve would be back out oh, of work okay. again. To regard what a gross, give me a gross figure per annum. What would decimate the country if you included them? Is it sixty thousand? But you want me to sit here and say that for somebody in forty thousand is well paid? I don't believe somebody in forty thousand is well. Paid. I don't want you. I want. To, I want it's a simple question I'm asking. What's what do you regard as low paid? Is John Crown low paid? Well, I mean, give me a figure. No, well, I'm Are, not low paid. John Crown isn't low paid, but... Okay, so that's 80,000, say, or 90,000 for TD. Let's work backwards. 80, 87. Yeah, okay, so what is 60,000? What do you reckon? But, I, I, like, it, it, it's... There are different it's, grades. No, 60,000 is not low paid, but I don't know. I don't think there's one significant yeah, okay. put-off point here. Mick, Mick Barry. There, there's, a, there's a figure that's used in the trade union movement, right? Uh, it's called the European Decency Threshold which would be 60% of median wages, right, as an absolute minimum. The last figure I have for the European decency threshold in this state was from 2013, and it came at €12.20. So I would imagine it's closer to the €13 Euro mark at this stage. And if you want to say that as a country we want to end low pay and abolish low pay, you have to pay people more than that. Well, just which, sorry, sorry, which, sorry to which is why no, I'll just finish my point there, uh, uh, Stephen. Sorry, which is why we put forward the proposal for twelve as a step towards fourteen, and why we think Labour's proposal to get to twelve twenty over a whole number of years by incremental increases is insufficient. We voted for the motion as better than the status quo, but it's not enough. And finally, I would just say in it, I do agree with the point that Stephen has raised about costs, but the key costs for working people at the moment is the question of mortgages and particularly the issue of rent at the moment. Mm -hmm. And we have to revisit the issue of rent control. The rent controls introduced by Fine Gael, Labour, Alan Kelly last year are not working. They were far too weak and we, we need real serious rent controls with teeth. Okay, Anne in Dublin says, what about the huge increase in stealth charges, local property tax, VAT, levies on everything? It's the cost of living that's killing people, she says. Uh, a texter says, it seems from tonight's vote that the Labour Party is more effective in opposition at getting socially progressive legislation through than they ever were in government. Curiouser and curiouser indeed, says this texter. Thomas in Innes Corthy says, the panel are talking about a living wage. How are people on social welfare of €188 Euro a week without a rise in seven years supposed to survive? And another texter says, there is no politician on €50,000 per annum. Knee of lines, tonight's <coughs> defeat for the government. Is it a sign of things to come, I wonder? Yeah, it's going to be par for the course, really. Uh, Fianna Fáil will basically decide every vote that we have. They decide to go with the government. They decide to go with the opposition. Um, and I think your second texter there is right. You know, Labour... Start, have s sort of started a campaign. Any battle they couldn't win in government, uh, they've brought now to private members' business. And this was one particular bugbear of theirs. And, and the argument happened along the lines that it's happening tonight. Fine Gael are seen as being the party of business, um, possibly perhaps verging towards the richer end and the more corporate end of business, maybe not as, as you know, looking and, and minding small, medium-sized enterprises as much. And, and that was kind of shown today in an OECD report that showed that what Stephen was saying is correct. There's kind of a stranglehold on lending still towards SMEs and, and they're paying the highest rates in Europe uh, for it, their it, loans. Is this populist, and people won't like this question for sure, but is this populist politics or is it really... Well, not an really, because it get, this basically now is past second stage, so it'll go to committee stage. I mean, I, the last time I was here, the government had just been kind of defeated on mortgages. A vote didn't happen. So this is seen as the first vote defeat. But... Uh, what I said that night, I'll say again tonight, the government doesn't have to be defeated in these areas. They can just allow something to pass through and they can work on it when it gets to the next stage. Um, the problem on both sides is that, uh, you know, opposition legislation that goes through that isn't good legislation uh, will need a lot of work. Um, and we're going to get log jammed with the amount of stuff that's going through because if every week the government loses a vote, this stuff all has to go somewhere. It all has to be dealt with at some point. Um, but of course, the government could always take the view that, you know, whatever piece of legislation is passed, it goes into that particular department and it's worked on there. John Crown, do you think the government should have accepted the Labour proposal tonight and run with uh, <coughs> improving a lot of low-paid workers, improving the minimum wage and so on? Yes, I think they should have. I think there was a, a clear need 
if the message that they went to the country on in the last election is that things are improving and that there's a recovery underway, I think they actually should have made a, a real effort at this stage to start to spread the fruits of that recovery more widely. And there's no doubt, I mean, you know, w- w- you will hear s- hard stories across all strata of Irish societies, the pressed middle. The pressed middle are in a bad way, but the pressed underclass or in a much worse way. And I, I think that's where the, you know, the first relief needs to come. We talk about the competitiveness, and I, I, I do get that. And the problem is that in the globalized world we're in, ultimately our competitors are offshore. They're not, the, they're not here. If we collectively are perceived as being a high-wage economy, it makes us more difficult to compete. But the problem is that we're competing effectively with developing what what really would be called sweatshop economies. We're we're dealing with people that have economies that are based on a model of very low wages, often in Asia and in Eastern Europe and in other places. And we're we're hearing, as Ross Perot famously said, the sucking sound of jobs, you know, leaving the developed West, the countries that developed and invested social democracy, that invented the affluent working class. It really was the United States which which did that. The notion that ordinary working people could send their kids to college, could own their own little house, could have a car. This these were really Western inventions. Uh, and when we often talk about the decline of the West, what we're actually missing is the relative rise of other places. So I, I, I do think it's going to be very hard for our economy or a handful of Western economies to look at these issues in isolation. Clearly, when you look at all of the macroeconomic trends, there is a disastrous level of inequality developing across the Western okay, world. Okay, so but would, would you the agree with McBarry? Incredible, incredible potential that has, not just for the unfairness of it, but for social destruction, for social disharmony, for the undermining of democracy. If people think that democracy has not worked for them, in a real sense, they will lose faith in it. Okay, so you say to Martin Hayden tonight on Fine Gael, you should have improved a lot of low-paid workers. Would you go as far as McBarry, though, and say the minimum wage should be 14 euros per hour? Well, I... I, 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 you know what? I have, an, I have a reputation for having an opinion on everything, and I don't understand the economics of how you'll work out what the minimum wage should be. But I'll say one thing. I love the optimism uh, that Martin is saying about, you know, we're going to do this over the five-year term of the government. If you're going to raise it, Martin, <laughs> I'd be planning on doing it within the next six months. Martin. I, I, I just make one final point. Do, we are at risk here of sitting around. The I'll decide if it's a final point oh, or not, Martin Hayden. Fair, fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, like, we're at risk here of... Uh, taking the reduction in our unemployment rate over the last couple of years for granted. There is a reason that uh, unemployment rate is now down below 8%. We've managed to make ourselves more competitive. We've managed to create an environment through action plan for jobs, through a series of measures to make it competitive again for employers to take staff back on. Absolutely, we want fairness in wages. We want workers to be... Uh, emigrating a whole bunch of the unemployed help too now, Martin, in, in truth. No, no, but, but the amount of people in work, there's 155,000 people in work today that are working in work in this country um, in 2012, John. So like, I, l- I, let, let's not just throw out that argument at, uh, about emigration. What kind of but, work, though? That's the question. Well, I, I'll give you an example. Job, I, is I, it job bridge schemes and the like? Absolutely not. No, no, the vast majority of those uh, 155,000 are full-time jobs. But I'll give you an example of Kerry Group that came into my county in Kildare with 900 jobs. We fought off competition from, from London, Amsterdam and other foreign countries. The reason we were able to get them back in here was because um, it, it, and they're a, well, they're an Irish company originally. They're very much a world player now. We got them in here because we're competitive and because we we were able to um, a, a attract them in as a as a good environment. When you say competitive. Do you, do you actually mean that the wages are low? So you went to Kerry Group and you said, "Come to Kildare." No, in Ireland, as you know, the wages are low. Jobs, they're a good quality job. But what I'm saying to you is, if, if if we lose, I, I think the average salary in, in uh, of those jobs is up seventy, eighty thousand. So it's it, it's it's a it's a higher end job. But my point to you is, like, the the spin off industry, like. If, I shudder to think of the cafe owner um, who, who's, uh, who's trying to keep their head above uh, water, who has to pay 14 euro an hour uh, to, to somebody serving the coffee. That's not going to be sustainable for an economy. And what kind of country do you want to have in a couple of years' time? I think we have to be careful. We, we have to be careful not to believe our own spin about how great we are at FDI. We're, we're not competitive. We used to be competitive. We're not competitive. We used to have graduates who were recognised as some of the best in Europe. They are no longer recognised as some of the best in Europe because of underinvestment in um, in education at all levels. Um, we used to have low input costs to business. Sorry, says who? Says who on which? O- on the graduates. Who says our graduates are no longer the best in Europe? Well, you can look at comparative data that shows that they're no longer rated as that. You can look at the rankings of our universities. We used to have two in the top 100. I think we've won in the top 200 now. Um, and if you talk to people in HR and FDI, they'll, they'll tell you this. I had a conversation with one pharma company uh, uh, probably about two years ago 
about chemical engineers and I'm, I'm an ex-engineer and he was saying, yeah, you know, we used to be seen as having the premium engineering graduates 15 years ago. There hasn't been the level of investment in engineering and science and research and basic research. It's all been stripped out in the last six, seven years. Um, and we no longer have that. And actually he was pointing out that at the international, when they're being pitched by Japan and others, actually the level of underinvestment in Irish education is now being used as a reason for, 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 you know, the other companies are saying, no, you shouldn't go to Ireland, sure, look what they're doing to their, look what they're doing to their education system. Um, so we are no longer competitive. Um, we still are a, an amazing country to live in. We are an amazing country for these executives to come in and raise their, raise their families in, and long may that last. But... Um, whilst Martin and I absolutely accept uh, there has been very much needed uh, job recovery, we cannot underestimate the level of pain and fear and suffering and anxiety that so many people who are working in this country are, 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 are de dealing with. You're talking, for example, about people who, uh, who were unfortunate enough to buy a property in 2004, 5, 6. They've got massive mortgages and they've taken, for example, public sector workers, massive pay cuts. I'll give you just one example. We met one of our meetings. We used to meet quarterly with the Troika. We met with them one day, and I don't know if you remember, there was an article in the paper about a guard who um, his life had been destroyed financially. And I think he was on the verge of homelessness. Um, I met a guard in Greystones when we were canvassing one day. He was very upset and he said, come in come into my house. There was himself and there was his pregnant wife and there were toasted cheese sandwiches on the table. And he said, that's what we can afford because we bought into a negative equity. You know, we bought into a, a, a bubble thing. That's what he's got left as a man who's putting his life and his, his, his safety on the line for us on an ongoing basis. The, the guy from the IMF who we met, he said, look, no one should have to do with what the, this particular guard in the papers was dealing with. But he said, He's earning 60 or 65 grand. And he said, look, I have PhD economists from Harvard working for me in Brussels who earn that money and they have an amazing life. He said, your problem here is an imbalance between the amount of money that is being paid and um, the amount of money it costs to lead a decent life here and the legacy costs that so many people are dealing with. And finally, Childcare. Yeah, but the problem, Childcare the problem, is a full the problem wage for in you, this country. Stephen Dunley, and all of the other parties uh, in the opposition at the moment is we had an election only a couple of months, weeks ago, really, and the, the parties went to the public and they said, look, this is what we will provide. Mm. And they voted for Fine Gael, the, the largest party in, in uh, the Dáil at the moment, to go and, and put a government together. So they didn't have trust in the Social Democrats. They didn't have as much trust in Fianna Fáil or Labour. Their vote collapsed. So they said, of the lot of ye, Fine Gael, who were in power over the last number of years, who imposed those cuts, who imposed this possibly inequality, some would say, they're the best of the lot. Well, I think as tonight's vote shows, actually, that's not what the, the people said at all. The people said, the jury's out on the lot of you. Um, they voted for Fianna Fáil, they voted for Fianna Gael. Um, we, the Social Democrats, got 3%, but sure, it was, our, it was our first time out. I mean, we weren't starting like Fianna Gael was from 70 or 65 or whatever whatever that was. Um, the Irish people didn't give a definitive answer. Okay, on, so, on, so the on jury the is out on the whole lot. On the political a, a direction. A texter says it's sickening to see Labour putting their left-wing clothes back on so that they can win more seats so that they can get back into government and collaborate with the right in the asset stripping of this country. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Alan Kelly is spoiling everything by appointing himself Minister in Absentia for wa Irish Water, he says, uh, that texter. Another texter, 33,000 is a lot more than the minimum wage. Martin Hayden hasn't a clue, simply, uh, uh, says that texter. Another one, Owen says, our tax system, system is not one of the most progressive. Our income tax system is. This is a crucial difference for people on low and fixed incomes. 51551 if you want to get in on the conversation. We'll move on because a single long-term vision for healthcare in this country, that's what the, the Health Minister Simon Harris said. That's what his dream is, he says. That's why he wants to set up a cross-party special committee to design a health service model for the next 10 years. Now, Professor John Crown, it, this cross-party committee, this special committee on health, will it work? Or is it simply a political tactic, tactic to insulate him from any criticism? Uh, it won't work. 
I mean, we're, I, I don't believe this is the mechanism for for fixing and reforming the health system. Um, the real, you know, honestly, let's distill this down to its element. You know, the same core of people drawn from the same, you know, collective consciousness of political parties that gave us our political meltdown, that gave us our economic meltdown, that brought us to the brink of disaster. This is the ranks of the people that are going to bring together the expertise to fix the health system. I'm sorry, I ain't holding my breath. Uh, I am a firm believer that there's a simple solution to this problem. You look at the most successful health systems in Europe and you try and emulate them. Uh, and to me, the, the data are very simple. You look at the countries that have a universal model of social insurance. They're by and large the Northern European countries. Probably the best example of it, I believe, is Germany. You assume a few things. If you introduce a model like that, you will largely eliminate inequality. You will heavily incentivize quality, activity, and efficiency. Um, you will spend more money on healthcare. Uh, but the money is not wasted. Spending money on health care is not bad for an economy. Wasting any public money is always bad for an economy, be it on health care or anything else. We, you know, when times are getting boomier, as our, as our previous prime minister said, you know, you will hear, you know, various pundits coming out and saying things are looking good. We're buying more cars. We're buying more white goods. Travel is up. Real estate prices. Are, these are all indices of a booming economy. But if dare you say... We're spending more money on healthcare. Oh, we can't do that. So what's Martin Hayden and Fine Gael doing wrong then? Uh, I don't, no disrespect, and I really don't want to personalise this to Martin or Fine Gael, but I just believe we have a political cohort in this country who don't know what they're talking about in the health system. I believe the real decisions in healthcare are all made by the bureaucrats in the civil service. I think there is a colossal level of political inertia. And I want to go on the record tonight, by the way, and praise Simon Harris for his intervention on the anti-melanoma drug pembrolizumab today because it is pretty obvious to anyone who has been studying this story developing over the last couple of weeks that the difference between this and previous problems was a individual politician took individual political responsibility, made a decision and made something happen. And my hat's off to him for that. Yeah, and this is not Simon Harris's fault, but this is after a three-month delay. Yeah, I mean, I think it says everything. I mean, there's, there's a whole culture within the department of the HSC, and I regard them as a solitary cultural entity. They were divided for, I think, reasons of isolating uh, lines of responsibility. But there, there is a cultural feeling that, you know, there's a whole group of warring factions out there in the health service, but thank God for us bureaucrats, we provide a degree of equity to it, because uniquely, not only in the health system, but uniquely in human history, we are not self-interested. I mean, that, that, that is the line they would have. Yeah, but hold on, you. you say you don't want to personalise it to Martin Hayden, I'm not saying you should, but in terms of Fine Gael's approach, Simon Harris's approach, he's saying let's get all of the heads around one table and design a system for the next 10 years, surely that's a good way to do it. All of the heads from Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael and Labour and Sinn Féin, yeah, it sounds like what could go wrong? But, but working together, well, Martin Hayden, what could go wrong? Because they've, but they've had 50 years, 60 years to do this, and that model of looking at it and having periodic reports and paroxysms of, you know, reformist rectitude has not worked. And I'm just deeply pessimistic about it. I believe that, um, you know, we had a clear decision in the 2011 election. We had a party that went in and said bravely, we are going to change the health system to a universal, single-tier insurance-based model, and they fluffed it completely. completely Martin Hayden. Fluffed it. Look, I think what is being proposed here is something that hasn't happened before, which is where all political parties come around the table and actually leave politics out of the health system. Because, and and I, w I would completely concur that depoliticising politics might just be a good thing. What John refers to in the past was actually Fine Gael standing up in, in government and being clobbered by the opposition for whatever stance we took, they take the opposite. When we were in opposition, we would have did the same to whoever was in government. And every five years or ten years, five years more, more often than not, the government parties would change and then somebody would come in with a new strategy. So the idea that ministers come and go, the idea that uh, parties co uh, come and go in and out of government, but that uh, the need for an, an overall plan of a good, like five years is not going to fix our, our health system alone. Uh, and, and that we, we get consensus and buy-in from Sinn Féin, from Labour. This is, this is new policy. From all sides. This could work, McBarry, could it? Well, let's have a look at it because the, the governments have already said... Uh, what road they want to go down in relation to the health service. It's there in the programme for government. So let's look at that briefly first. In the programme for government, they say the following. Number one, they want to progressively dismantle the HSE. Number two, they want to um, follow the example of what's happened in the UK and create hospital trusts uh, financed on a, a kind of a standalone basis. 
uh, where they would be able to raise uh, private finance for their hospitals or sections for their hospitals or contract out to private operators. And what you've seen in the UK with that is creeping privatisation uh, within a kind of a neoliberal policy for, for the health services. So that is the government's programme. Now, alongside that, you, you have the setting up of an all-party all committee. Uh, I'm a National Health Service man. I think the best example that we've seen in Western Europe in the last 50 years has been the original idea of the UK National Health Service. I think the idea that John has outlined there is an improvement on what we have in this country. But I think a National Health Service is a better way to go. The idea that the, the state is the key provider of health care. How much would that cost, though? It would cost, uh, well, for example... Cheap. The, the, the NHS is cheap. The, the NHS biggest, is a lot, lot cheaper than America. The single biggest argument made for the NHS is it's cheap. I'm sorry to cut across. I beg your no, pardon, Michael. It's the, it's the single biggest argument made for the NHS, which produces inferior outcomes in things like cancer care or access to dialysis. It is not a great service. It's a, it's a great service for giving a a super subsistence level of service to everyone, making sure that nobody will die because they can't get routine surgery, that they can't get there. It's not an excellent service anymore. Make. Um, but it is very cheap. It, it is that the British consistently keep costs down. When you put it under that kind of central controlling thumb, you can't and keep And what's the difference down. between that and the German model that you propose? The German model is based more on insurance. There's more of a linkage of activity. <laughs> and the insurance, by the way, is not for profit. In, in most cases, it is not for profit. I, I'm not a big believer in for-profit insurance. Um, the Canadian system is very good where they have mandatory national insurance, but the, the government doesn't actually micromanage big chunks of the health service. They provide the regulatory framework in which it works. The German system is like that. In Germany, most people, there are exceptions, can take whatever their insurance instrument is, and they can choose to go to a state-run hospital, to a private hospital, to a university hospital, to a religious hospital, to a hospital run by, you know, their, their major industrial employer or whatever. They have that choice. That kind of thing tends to be a little more expensive, but it does produce better outcomes. But why are you so uh, pessimistic about this uh, cross-party committee? Because they could invite in experts from various fields. You could be before the committee. You proposed that idea. They might accept it. Uh, I, I just think that the big problem we have is that there is a model that is very deeply entrenched within the administrative side of our health service, which will not be shaken. Uh, I, I think it's... Who do you mean exactly? Well, the senior civil servants in the HSC and a, and a rapidly, enormously rapidly increasing cohort of professional health administrators and managers uh, who, who just are not in the mood to see a system developing which uh, detracts from their power, which actually democratizes the system, which allows people to choose where they go, and which, God forgive, God forbid, might actually put health professionals in some executive so positions of authority. Stephen Donnelly, you have a man here who's an expert in health and an expert in Irish politics since he's been in the uh, Eructus over the last number of years, saying that politicians don't have a snowball's chance in hell in uh, reforming health. It, we may not, but we have to try. And, you know, part of this is reforming ourselves. So the motion that was agreed today uh, came from the Social Democrats. Mm. And uh, we spoke to Fianna Fáil, we spoke to AAA PVP, and we spoke to Sinn Féin, and we spoke to um, Labour, and we spoke to um, the Greens, and we spoke to Fianna Gael, and everyone signed up. And I spoke on the motion today and went to great pains to say this is, a, this is a dull motion. But actually, what's just happened could never have happened previously. Because what would have happened is someone would have come along from opposition, be it Martin with Fianna Gael or an opposition or whoever. This isn't about Fianna Gael. This is just about whoever is in government. And said, here, listen, we have, this, we have this idea. We think it's a flyer. We think there's political support. And the answer from government is, is, is no. You know, we're in charge, we're going to do whatever you want. So imagine a tiny new party, the Social Democrats, had an idea, it's a good idea, and I'll address John's yeah, address point, point, but he's college. saying that politicians are not the main problem. The main problem are senior civil servants who will not make change happen. I agree, but you have to therefore get around that, right? Um there's lots of, the system we have, the healthcare system we have is, is, it's deeply frustrating, I imagine, for people like John in particular, for anyone who's using it, because um, we have the second highest expenditure ratio as a percentage of GDP, the second highest in the OECD. So we spend a fortune on our healthcare system. And we're regularly rated in the bottom fifth or the bottom third in any of the comparative stuff. So, oh, and we have some of the best trained clinicians. And we have a very easy environment in which to run a health, to run any system compared to other countries around the world. And yet for all of this, we don't get the outcomes that we all want, that everybody wants. The clinicians want, the, the, the patients want, the politicians want, the public, the public want. 
There's lots of operational reasons for this. Partly it's a lack of empowerment. So people like John don't get to make the decisions that they know how to make closest to the patient, closest to the ward, closest to the operating theatre um, and so forth. Talk to the chief exec of hospitals and they'll tell you they don't have the operational you're, you're control not point. they need to have. No, 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 I'm sorry, a senior I'm civil servant. I say, good idea, Stephen, but hang on now. We have the unions on our backs. We, yeah. can't, we can't do any of that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what do you need? You need the bit we're missing, which is a vision for healthcare. The reason that the politicians can be played off each other and that the clinicians can be shown, you know, the, the consultants are, oh, they're just money grabbing people and they're an elite group. Oh, well, don't even talk about the doctors. And as for the nurses, sure, they're going on strike. Everyone can be divided and everyone can be, can be demonized. Why? Because we have no agreed vision for what success in healthcare is. And there's a bunch of big, dirty secrets that have to get aired. And this is one way of airing them. One of those is it isn't sustainable to have hospitals doing lots of different things all over the country. Modern healthcare systems don't work like that. They require a level of scale um, that we don't have in Ireland. Another one of them is the cost of providing modern healthcare over the next 10, 20, 40 years. It's, it's, a, it's a hockey curve. As a percentage of GDP, it's going to become incredibly expensive for two brilliant reasons. One, healthcare professionals are getting much better at providing healthcare and two, people are living longer. Well, you've put your finger on a problem that isn't associated with the civil service at all. It's associated with politicians, is it not, Neave Lyons, that if you tell a politician, you know that hospital in your constituency, mm. we, we have to close down that service. That's where the wheels come off. Yeah, I mean, this government are kings at commissions, inquiries, reports, there comes a point where you have to devise a policy as a party and you have to just see it through. They had a policy five years ago and they had two different doctors in office that sort of dismantle that policy bit by bit as they were told, you know, it just wouldn't work. Now, I know the idea what's been, you know, promoted here, this that we get consensus that it's a 10-year plan. I mean, maybe we'd be better off with a permanent minister or a chief exec or something of the overall, the overarching service. And certainly I think you really need to break it down a little bit more department-wise in terms of management and healthcare. It's all just a bit too muddled at the moment. But I mean, if you were to say to Mick now that at the end of this consensus process that either see who hate or the mercy is going to lose, you know, its emergency services or its cancer services or whatever. He's just going to say no to that proposal. And there ends the vision, Stephen Donnelly. Yeah, well, that's true. But part of the reason for that is a lack of transparency. So here's what they've done successfully in other countries. They've said, you know what, we, you have oncology services close to you and you have oncology services far away from you. What you don't know is that the oncology service is far away from you, which are in this big level four hospital. If you take them, you're twice as likely to survive. Hmm. That actually... No, hang is, on, no. Is, hang on, because we've seen in the past, and I don't know if John Crown, you'd agree with this, that logic doesn't always come into it. Well, because a local service is going, and voters tell the politician, a local service is going, and he'll say, or she'll say, I'll stop that, and in, give in, me your vote. You're it's right. It's about votes, is it not? It, it, well, it, it partly is about votes, but, it is pe- pe- but people will demand that in the absence of the data. Now, what has... Uh, hold on now, John Crown, C- 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 let, 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 let me just finish no, this my, bit. My point, is, my point is, my question to you is that logic doesn't always come into it so when politicians are looking for votes. N- no, agreed. But what happens is, when you give people the choice, Choice of a better service further away or a not as good service close by, they opt for the better service further away. Well, and our whole political system political nearly power. ground to a halt over Waterford General Hospital while this government was being put together. You know, and that's that's where it stands. I mean, look, the likes of uh, a Dennis Nocton and a Frankie Fian who both went different directions over a particular hospital issue. You know, look who got elected and who's now in cabinet, and look who lost their seat or decided not to run. Um, like, I think as well with something like you know this broad vision. I'd actually prefer to see small little things being implemented quickly than one broad overarching. That can happen at the same time. Mm. But Mm. one of the biggest things we're lacking and have been forever is the primary care situation. I mean, that has been knocking around now for decades. We've been talking about. But that message, because it's all... you know, confounded in language and service users and even the words primary care themselves, you know, the message should be getting out there to people. Go as local as you can for the services that you can and then bring it to the hospital when you need to. Like, nobody has ever run an advertising campaign along those lines. A texter says, Peter in Dublin, all universal healthcare creates is those who can afford private healthcare get free access to public healthcare also. Is that a point, John Crown? 
Well, I mean, you see, I, I, let me go back a peg, and I, 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 I am sympathetic to the endlessly repeated arguments about the irrational structure of our small hospital network and, and the trend towards better care when you reach a certain threshold in terms of size, concentration of resources, etc., in a hospital. But it, it's not that simple. The relationship is not linear. And if you have everybody going to one place and the place is mediocre and you're not paying for the cancer drugs, the survival will be poor. And that's why the NHS, which is incredibly overly, every bureaucrat in the world loves the British NHS, the most centralized, the most audited, the most royal commissions, and amongst the worst outcomes for cancer. Everybody knows this because if you don't actually buy the drugs that work and give people access to the treatments which work, uh, having everything centralized is no good. So the core problem in Ireland is not the small hospital, Stephen. It is a problem, and if we had a health sword, one of the things which would have to be addressed. The core problem is the perverse dysfunctional incentives which exist because of the way we fund and manage and run the health service. But how much uh, insurance let me finish, would Niamh. people let have me finish, to pay? Niamh. Yeah, no, I'm just asking a question. No, you just talk. Yeah, how, how much would people have to pay under the German model? Because when we started running the numbers for uh, what was going to be universal health insurance here, it was going to start costing people four or five grand. So, I mean, uh, the biggest problem there is just that, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily level the pitch if some people are getting it free because they're on a lower wage and other people have to pay four or five grand for it. Well, we're already paying. Well, well again, just, I'm sorry, you did cut across me there and I'll let you finish, but, uh, but the point is, in the model we're proposing, it's a model based on social solidarity. People fa- pay a fixed percentage of their income for healthcare and it is reserved for healthcare and nothing else. Rich people pay more than poor people. Your tax goes down by the amount you pay in healthcare. This is not an extra charge on top of what you're paying. This is not a freebie for the government to say, you can now use the 5% of my tax, which at the moment you're spending for my healthcare, and actually pay off the debt to Anglo-Irish Bank with it. No, no, you're going to get less that money because that money is now being spent by me for my not-for-profit social health insurance model. Will it be a little more expensive? Yes, it will. But because you take the the inefficiencies out of the system and you end the inequity in the system, it will be better for the economy at large. Well, surely, John, if there is more money in the system, if that did occur, you would have vested interests, uh, interested parties, you could say, like consultants, like nurses, like doctors, say, look, there's more money and we need more money. We need more staff and pay. You have to have systems in place to stop people from gouging the system. The, The Irish health system, as Stephen has pointed out, is not underfunded. And I have repeatedly said this over 20 years. It is malfunded. Mm-hmm. We apply the funds in a way which incentivizes bad activity, inefficiency, and inequality. And I have to tell you, I don't actually see this super committee, this star chamber of deputies, coming together and actually fixing that. Now, I hope I'm wrong. And if they invite me in to make a presentation, I'll be delighted. Mark Thanks. Hayden. Yeah, I could just touch on a couple of points from Ed there. Uh, to suggest that nothing is happening or nothing is happening while this committee uh, are ongoing is wrong. We have 48 primary care centres that have been open. I know the effect that the one has had in Newbridge and my constituency in South Kildare or the, the new one opening in Kildare Town at present. There's a reason accident emergencies aren't called uh, that anymore. They're called EDs because if you have an accident now with a minor ailment, you're not sent, you're not encouraged to go to your hospital, you're encouraged to go to your primary care centre or deal with your GP. We have a GP contract that's outdated and that has been renegotiated. We have free GP care for under sixes to be extended to under twelves this year, allowed for an Is that not malfunding budget. again? Because you're funding uh, no. the, the uh, uh, five-year-old of a millionaire. But the point I was going to make was... Is that not yeah. malfunding? Answer John, John Crown's point. No, I don't believe so because, you know, if we can get people earlier access uh, in, uh, into the health system and deal with their problems earlier, same as with, with the over, over 70s, then you can, you can nip an awful lot of problems in the bud. Make just, uh, just one point I wanted to make finally on, on new politics and, and John's pessimism of where this, uh, where this is going to go. If John is brought in, I'm sure he will be as part of, uh, of the review as, as an expert from the outside, or if a politician like Mick or Stephen or anybody else has a different view to come in and it, it has an exorbitant cost in on it, they too will have to be able to say, well, how will this work out? And this is where all politicians sitting around the table, we can use our new budgetary uh, committee as well to say... Well, but hold on, are Dáil committees, are Edith's committees capable of coming up with a cohesive vision after hearing loads of different views? We, we saw the banking inquiry and we saw what happened to the banking inquiry report. Are Edith's committees actually capable of doing that? I believe they are because this is about consensus. And based we're, on what? We're, we're, what you based that on? We're due to talk about new politics now and new politics is about the fact that the government party is going to have to compromise that government parties aren't used to having done, uh, done in the past. So we in Fine Gael know we have to change. We, we won't get stuff through even though we're, we're in government. Was there cross-party consensus on the banking inquiry? 
There was not. There no, there was, there was no. cross-party consensus on bailing out the banks. Which is Cro- give, give me, a, give me a, a an edit of this few, committee with that compiler report that oh. had cross-party consensus. That worked out oh, well, they well. all put out, they all put out reports. But like, if you were to have this committee looking at the likes of, you know, the length of time it should take an ambulance to get to a house. You know, you'd basically be looking at a situation where you'd have a national average. Now, would it be satisfactory that someone living in Dublin can get an ambulance in two minutes and someone in Loud is below average and has to get it in five? You know, are the politicians who were from Loud on that committee going to keep their seat? The simple answer to that is no. Make once again. Yeah, I just want to comment on uh, the point that Martin raised about uh, rolling out free GP care for under sixes. Uh, there has been free GP care for every man, woman and child, rich or poor, in the UK since 1948 and 70 years on um, you've got a, a Fine Gael led government here struggling with a rollout for a section of the population, the under sixes it's another example as to why a national health service model, you know where you have um, the healthcare provided in the main by the state with funded from uh, taxpayers a pool of money and then GP services, hospital care, dental, mental health provided free at the point of use. In my opinion, it's the way to go, and it's what we'll be arguing for on this So you, you would agree with, say, a developer who owns half a Cork, who's a billionaire, you'd give his child uh, free GP care as well? I'd give every child in the country, but i tell you what i do with the developer, right, is that they would be, as part of the society, paying tax as part of a progressive tax system, and they would be paying an awful lot more than the unemployed man or the, or the person on the low wage. Okay. So they, they, they put their, 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 their money into the pot and they draw from the pot, same as everybody else. Jared and Scurry says, so Simon Harris wants to bring all the interested parties together and have a chat. I'm pretty sure that the previous health ministers went down that path as well and nothing improved. He needs to put his ideas to them and not the other way around, says Jared. John says the government needs to take on vested interests like consultants, GPs, nurses, etc., who've engaged in unionised restrictions practices for decades they bleed our well funded health service says John 51551 Neve Lines new politics was mentioned there since this government has uh, come into operation do you think it's working I think it's actually too early to say at like what tonight's vote would tell you possibly not um, but as Stephen was saying, you know, with this health situation, I mean, Roshan Chortall was the one who, who recommended this to Simon Harris. He met her in the corridor, as far as I know, of Leinster House. Um, and she pointed out that it would be a good idea. And a couple of days later, I think it was, it was being floated as, as policy. Um, so any time that the government are listening and opening to taking something on. Um, but in general, I, I don't see a huge amount of work getting done this doll. I mean, the Shannon is coming back next Tuesday and they have nothing to debate. So they'll just be standing up the way the doll was for the first three or four weeks making statements. And while that's useful, it doesn't really add anything to public policy. Some people say, Martin Hayden, that the level of cynicism in uh, politics is not new at all. And they look at, for example, uh, the Taoiseach's nomination to the Shannon. Six out of 11 were Fine Gaelers. Oh, yeah, and there was a mix of um, Fine Gael members and also of independents, um, and he generously gave uh, Fine Gael three uh, nominees as well, which which he didn't have to uh, after being elected as a, as a Taoiseach. But if you look at the role... And you, the, or maybe he did. The, the difference, the difference, maybe he did. The, the difference between Fianna Fáil's nominations, uh, they were independent. Fine Gael... So, and, so uh, were some of Andy Kelly's. And who? Uh, Mary Louise O'Donnell and um, Billy Lawless were, were... Billy Lawless ran for Finnegal, did he not? Yeah, but like uh, as, as somebody based out in Chicago and is the first uh, diaspora yeah. re- but did he, run for, he ran for Finnegal. He, he did back in 91, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah. a Finnegal member, but yeah. not... Uh, so it's still, he's can, an independent Finnegal member, is that you mean, who ran for the party? In a, in I, a, I actually don't know if he's going to be a member of the parliamentary party or not, but you could definitely differentiate okay. him from the other six. Okay, so two, uh, two, we have two. Who else... Uh, no, no, that, that's very common. That, that's it. Yeah. So absolutely. all of the rest were James Riley, Pawdy Coffey, all of the people who lost their seat. They got a nomination to the Shannon. Is that right? Yeah, like Pawdy Coffey has huge experience in the area of housing as, as a, a junior minister. He's a lot to bring to that. John O'Mahony is former chairperson of the Oireachtas Committee on Transport, Tourism and Sport. You can make a case for every single um, a, a new senator that, that's been appointed. But when you're talking about new politics, I just want to say that, that I do feel there we have an empowered parliament. I'm actually really excited about this term ahead now because I saw in the past ministers charge into the doll, um 
not having to listen to the opposition because basically they could read their scripted speech and, the, uh, speech and they knew they had they could march mm-hmm. in all the backbenchers behind them afterwards. The opposition now have a power but with that is a responsibility. Mm-hmm. So when they stand up and they call for things that in the past they could populously call for no that wasn't going to be voted through, they now actually have the power to potentially pass amendments that could have a cost implication that could change okay. policy but they'll have a responsibility that uh, how they, those measures work out. John Crown, are you equally policy? excited? I, I'd have to say that saying this is due politics is like, like saying that the White Star Line offered new transportation arrangements to the passengers on the Titanic after it hit the life for the li- after it hit the iceberg too cynical John yeah but so just for one second I just in terms of the new politics and in terms of the consensus around this alleged you know this new health super committee just remember the problem is not divisions between the political parties in terms of fixing the health service and the evidence for that was the last government where they had a thumping majority they could thumb their nose at all the opposition parties and bring in any health reform they wanted and they didn't. That is not the problem. And I'm not sure that getting the politicians together, I hope it does, but I'm not as optimistic as Stephen is that it will address and fix the problem. Yeah, but like, I was interested to hear Andy Kenny the other day saying there'll be no more guillotining, which I hope is true, and that there's no more A-list, B-list and C-list of legislation now. It's a bit, you know, lofty and a bit inside baseball to be mentioning it, but there are different priorities for legislation going through the House. Now what they're basically saying is, actually, anything that comes before us will be dealt with quickly and we'll try and get it mm. through and get it done. And I think people would prefer to see that happening than to see important bills kind of lingering around and just never getting dealt we've with. Also got it. We've also got to accept that this is new this is new for the country mm-hmm. this is new for the civil service this is new for the this is new for the politicians we are moving from a traditional monopoly or duopoly to a more european system mm-hmm. where you've got more groups that have to form coalitions there are going to be mistakes it is going to be rocky but mm. this is a transition to a more okay. grown up politics Mick Barry I think there's two things at play here I, I think a, a few years ago uh, people were nervous of taking on the government uh, and now the government are nervous of taking on the people that's as a result of the anti-water charges campaign I think the other issue is the arithmetic in the house you have a right wing government but it's a weak right wing government and they certainly can be put under pressure OK we'll see uh, PJ right says wing. I've been in hospital for six weeks and that man is is spot on with bad hospital spending. Ihiwa, he says. And finally, a texter says, tomorrow my wife will visit a surgeon and he'll relieve her of €175. So, Falk Madiga Shene Muwechisla, Martin Hayden, Stephen Donnelly, Mick Barry, Montal of John Crown, Niamh Lyons.